All right, guys, we are going to discuss how to get rid of DocuSign. Um, today, welcome to the Select All podcast. Um, we, we like to discuss ideas and different things that are happening around the world, um, essentially anything. Um, but today, we're going to figure out how to get rid of DocuSign using the use of blockchain. Um, well, there's a potential idea, so we'll see if it works. Uh, Mo, how about you explain the idea? What, what was the idea that you brought up? For sure. Um, so I'm thinking a way of combining like, or basically the gist of it is you take a snapshot of a signed document that you own or something. Um, and you tokenize that with your own private key on some crypto chain. And then you publish that document on chain so that it can be verified by like other users, um, like, I, I really think it not only like, yeah, it beats DocuSign, but also is a way of preserving like public sign documentation that like we all have to do and is all public available, but like taking it away from the hands of like, I guess, administrators or bureaucrats and putting it, you know, for everyone to see and democratizing it. Um, right. Still fleshing out some of the bits, but hopefully we can get a good discussion on like the crux of the idea here. Yeah, so, so decentralizing I, when... signing the signing process essentially. Yep. Yeah. Cool. It, it it's interesting because like when you first brought it up, I, I thought about it and I was like, okay, it's cool, but then what are the advantages, right? What what are you bringing that DocuSign isn't? Why would people switch over? For sure. Um, I think some of the benefits are definitely like the decentralization bit where you're not relying on a single company. Um, and I think the the big thing about DocuSign is that like, will DocuSign be around for like a hundred years? I mean, hmm. if we were to compare the life, life cycle of DocuSign as a company that verifies and st like um, stamps these documents versus so an open technology that is meant to be redu multiply redundant and publicly available. Like, I think that's where the value proposition comes in. Like, right. I don't know, uh, a lot of government documents, they have to be stored somewhere, right? And we like, uh, for example, the other day I, have to, I, uh, I was getting like the documentation for the blueprints to my house. Now, for me to, achieve, like, anyone can really do that. You don't need special permissions. You just have to email the city and be like, hey, I, I want access to this document. They send you a link and they're like, you have to pay X amount to retrieve it. Whereas if, but like, I, ideally that data is public, right? And right, yeah. It should be audited by the public, right? We, you, there is a layer of trust between you, me and then the city administrator and them retrieving this document, right? Yeah. Decentralization, like you're removing that, because like, we're trying to, I guess, not not a totally trustless system, but we're trying to minimize the trust, or or rather, we're trying to be transparent about, about the contracts within our systems, and yeah. having it on chain is a way to have these these contracts be like transparent to everyone to see. Yeah, no, that's fair. I think th it allows everyone to um, at least have the middleman get out of the way, right? Like they're charging for information that um, is just available to them, right? They, and it's the city. So I'm not sure why they're charging us for it when it's, especially if it's your own house. So like you've <laughs> yeah. paid for the house and you want blueprints to your own house and you got to pay the city to give you information about that which is very interesting. Um, but yeah, no, I agree with you. I think there's that there's definitely a room for this. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts, Trent? So uh, maybe let's break down the, the sequence here of how um, it would take place. So so you're saying you take, a, you take a scan document, so you scan a document, right? So the document can be anything. So let's say it's a, a deed to a house, right? Or, mm -hmm. or a lease whatever you want to call it. Um, so you're suggesting you, you scan this using a device. So let's say it's a phone, right? So then you would have an app that would do the scanning, right? 
and then mm-hmm. once it's scanned how does it transfer onto the blockchain so you're saying it you convert it to byte data what does that even mean byte data is just like any like data format that you can store on chain um like that's the good uh segue into some of the constraints that i was thinking about as i was thinking about this is that like what are the costs to store store this byte data on chain right like mm-hmm. a scanned PDF of one page is like a megabyte, right? And storing that online is pretty cheap. Like most places you can store that for free, but like on chain, there is some cost to store that, right? Um, and like, that's where it's like, oh, like if I were to mint this NFT of me signing this document, does that like, am I, cause what minting an NFT can be what, like a hundred bucks sometimes? Yeah. Well, it's got, gotten down yeah. now because of yeah. proof of stake. Um, it's actually yeah. uh, fairly cheap relatively to how it was. But so I would I would add one uh, add to this idea, and I think instead of um, taking a scan of the signed document, right, I would do it in two parts. I would actually get the hash of it. I would get the hash mm-hmm. of the full document, and then I would actually upload it to IPFS which is the interplanetary file system, which is also distributed. So at least the document is proliferated across and then it already has the MD5 hash on it. And that you could put on a chain, um, which would be, it's a 32 bit string. So it'd be much, much cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And then that way you just compare the MD5 hash and make sure that there's no content that has changed. Um, And now you've got a way to validate that the content is, uh, legitimate and also you have it um kind of distributed because of the ipfs right it, it's kind of mm-hmm. gone on multiple computers so i think that the only thing you can't do is the private key portion that you had mentioned so having it so that you can encrypt it using your private key i think if you wanted encrypted documents then it'd be a bit yeah a, a, a little more difficult that's fine i think i i said sign it with, with your private key as a way of assigning like ownership like this is definitely made by this person but i think if you're also just tokenizing it with your or if you're creating the transaction with your own private key to upload this like hash right then you're going to be known as the creator of this document right yeah right and so then i think it comes down to like the docusign portion of uh signing itself right they have that ability to have multiple parties sign the same document um, so you would have to have an interface that allows for first of all signing and then mm-hmm. everybody would have to have their yeah multiple private keys to be able to actually encrypt that document or not encrypt it but sign it somehow uh, to add that information on there as well so wouldn't it be a functionality similar to multi-sig wallets yeah, I would say. But the only difference with multi-sig wallets is you you generally create multi-sig wallets with uh, fixed people that have the private key. With something like DocuSign, mm. uh, it's going to be having different parties every single time. So it's like, how do you, that you, you would be like, that's a lot more costly to create multi-sig wallets just to be able to do that, right? But, but okay. Yeah, that's fair. So, so like a, a very simple use case would, would involve say two parties, right? And most likely the parties involved would know each other, no? Or are you suggesting scenarios where a, it's a use case where the parties don't know each other? Like, yeah. Well, so what's an example of that. Yeah. So for example, look at real estate transactions, right? Okay. When you, when you're putting an offer for a house, um, you do, you go through DocuSign and you get the, first of all, it's like as a realtor, um, I sign it and then I send it to my clients and they'll sign it. Right. So that's three parties that, yeah, we know each other, but we don't actually know the sellers potentially. Right. Um, that the agent, the other agent knows, we know the agent, but the seller themselves, we likely haven't even met yet. And so they will sign it. And then one, if they agree or not, and then the uh, seller agent will sign it. So that's six people involved potentially uh, on a single property, right? And three of them you don't really know. Um, so that that's one scenario, I would say. Okay, okay. 
So then could it be, uh, so in that scenario, then could, could you not have uh, an interface um, before that or some sort of, um, some sort of interface where you get that info beforehand? So then you can create or, or, or then, yeah, I can't quite explain it, but you see where yeah. I'm going with it? <clears throat> like are you saying create a multi-sig wallet on the fly yeah based on the so based on who is going to be involved right then you can create you can create use that information to create the private key yeah yeah so i, I guess there'd be multiple private keys involved but yeah I don't, I, to be honest, I don't know how you would do that uh, as of right now, but yeah, I, I think this is a great idea. I think it has, I think uh, cool. potential. the merit is like, can you beat DocuSign or similar services based on cost of minting the, the signed transaction and then uploading the IPFS to, or sorry, uploading your signed document to IPFS and then having, having that document being validated by multiple parties yeah right like what's the what's the price of docusign for like an enterprise yeah i don't i don't know and i don't think you'd beat it to be honest because it's That's like fair. just just by uh because they their service costs next to nothing for each uploaded document whereas um or at, le at least even the checksum uploading that many checksums um would actually be more costly i think overall um, per month than what DocuSign is worth, right? Because for them, that's nothing. Like, that's on one of their servers and they could probably handle a lot more than what uh, IPFS probably could. And another another yeah. thing I'm realizing is while we're saying this is, and I think there are hurdles that you can get by. Um, because, for example, you could actually have... Um, so there's two ways you could do this. First of all... Um, Actually, one way I think would be involved. If you have a document and the document needs to be private, that's one issue. You can't mm -hmm. have like real straight transactions going through and all of this information is public. That's um, what I was just thinking that. Yeah. Right? And so it needs to be private somehow. And then also um, you can't have it so that it costs more to do it on chain than it does on DocuSign. And the way you get around yeah. that is create a layer two. So do everything on layer two and then settle it, settle it a bit later on. And I think that delay would be more than sufficient for most people, right? Mm. And if you want to say, okay, I want to commit this document right now, it goes through another stream and it just commits it. Whereas it's like, yeah, that's fine if I can commit it later. And then it packages it all up and commits it all at once as a single transaction, right? That allows um, edits to, to do it that way. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good point. Um, if they're fine with that, it's in a certain period of window and, and they're fine with that, that would, that would work. So one important thing I would say is bringing up ZK rollups, which is zero knowledge proofs. And then you can prove that the document was signed by this private key, et cetera, or, or these parties. And you can have probably information about the document that you need, uh, without revealing the information of the document. You could just say, yep, this, this exists and this is valid, et cetera, but you don't have to release anything about the document to know if it exists, uh, which is very cool. Um, so I think using zero knowledge proofs, a layer two, and actually uploading the documents in IPFS instead with encrypted private keys would probably be a good solution to what you're saying. All right, we've solved it, guys. Yeah. <laughs> DocuSign's out of business. It's over. DocuSign's out of business. <laughs> Apparently, they're actually investing in uh, uh, blockchain stuff uh, a fair bit. I wouldn't be surprised. I, yeah, I, I can see where their like, incentives align between what kind of v v validity a, uh, a public blockchain can provide and their service. Yeah. It just makes sense. Mm -hmm. It just makes sense. It's like DocuSign would be like, uh, why wouldn't we do this? It's it's a way to prove that it actually is signed. That's what they were trying to do, right? Yeah, uh, to yeah. validate. And they've become the verifiers and kind of the escrow uh, 
of the validation amongst parties. And now they have this thing that allows them to do that uh, for free, essentially. Not for free, but it has it embedded in as a part of the stack. Why wouldn't they use that? The only downside is, is they'll probably put themselves out of business because of the fact that <laughs> the code that they write will is are also public. And so <laughs> anybody can just make a copy of it and just use it, right? Can they can they uh, can they make it not public? No, because the code is that's the quote unquote downside of of uh, utilizing code on the blockchain, right? It's everything's public. Every transaction is public. Um, mm-hmm. It has to be, and so you can't make your code unreadable. Otherwise, uh, even the blockchain, like Ethereum's blockchain, couldn't read it. And if it's readable by the blockchain then it's readable by every node and every anybody can have a node right or at least read transactions so how would you solve the privacy issue then if that's the case everything's public in terms of even uh the actual say documents being transacted how would you, I think yeah. you store that? you store the document encrypted between all the signed parties on ipfs that way you can see like which party signed a document and you can see that the the document exists. You just don't know what the document is until one of the signers decrypts it for you. So um, I'm the non-nerd in the group. (laughs) What the (laughs) hell is IPFS? All all, all I'm thinking of is FPS, first person shooter. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, that's fair. Uh, We should have explained that earlier. Uh, My bad. So IPFS, I believe, stands for Interplanetary File System. And what it is, is think of it like Interplanetary Files. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Let me take that in. In It's not actually Interplanetary (laughs) File System. That's what it's called. That's what it's called. I have no <laughs> idea why. These guys have been planning for Elon Musk's like future of Mars as well, so they wanted wanted interplanetary. I can just um, imagine a bunch of nerds sitting in a room like, hey, let, let's come up with a name for this. <laughs> it, it is an interesting problem, right? Like if humans... Yeah. Sorry, we're, we're branching way off, so maybe we should cut the conversation soon. But last word, it is interesting... Like, it is interesting because there is a future where humans are within multiple like planets, like far enough distances, yep. and trying to resolve like a interconnected system like the internet, like that is a hard technical problem. So I can see why people jumped on it when like now. Yeah. Well, they, yeah. I don't know why they named it that way, but otherwise. I agree with you, Mo. Like, it is an interesting problem. And I, I want to go down that path, but before I, I do it, I just want to answer uh, uh, yeah. uh, Trent's question. So, essentially, interplanetary file system, what it is, is like a think of um, torrents, right? Everybody yeah. has um, a copy of, of that um, kind of file. And so, once you upload it into interplan- interplanetary file system, you actually can't take it back, you're unable to delete files. Um, from my understanding. So once they're up, they're up. Because once you put it as a part of the kind of network, somebody else gets a copy and then they send another copy to someone else. They send another copy to someone else. And now multiple nodes have it. And so it's it's very difficult to actually go ahead and destroy that file um, because there's too many copies out there now, right? So it's, it behaves similarly to the blockchain in that sense. But how does that help with privacy? No, it helps with the distribution. It doesn't help with the privacy. So what Mo said was you would encrypt the file before you upload it with the private key um, or multiple private keys. And then yeah. the only way you could uh, retrieve that file is it would the contents would still be on multiple people's computers and nodes. Uh, by nodes, I just mean computers. It would be on multiple nodes and you could retrieve the file, but nobody would be, would be able to read it other than the person who's encrypted it. So then you you would download the file and decrypt it whenever you wanted to read it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So that solves the privacy issue. The ZK rollups, which is zero knowledge proofs, if you had a way to create a version of the zero knowledge proof to allow them to answer questions, um, then you could you could at least give information to other people that aren't part of the private key holders uh, without revealing content, the direct contents of the file, 
um, which is really cool. Okay, so that that would be scenarios where they could look at parts of the file, uh, but not see names, for example, or correct, not see the same. Okay, got gotcha, gotcha. or correct. vice versa, even. Yeah, so it could be if you code it in a way or create the algorithm in a way, you could be like, what is the address of the file? What is uh, or what is the address of the home that was sell, sold in this contract, etc.? What was the price, uh, for instance? And it, would, it wouldn't it would give any information about the sellers or the buyers or any other information you didn't want to give. Um, you could say, what is the status? Was it a uh, sold conditional? Was it not? Was it, uh, you know, things along those lines. Um, depending on how you actually set that up. Okay. But, yeah. Interesting. But, yeah, I wanted to go back to Mo's point about um, that interesting problem of connecting um, multiple planets. That would be interesting. Like, the internet works, obviously, with, like, lines, and now Starlink does have some sort of speed. But going to Mars, that would take forever. Like, sending information, I think it's, like, what, eight minutes? No, that's sun. The light, light from sun to earth is about eight minutes. Um, is it? And then, yeah. And I think Mars is, is the fourth planet, correct? It's earth and then Mars or no, yeah. Mars and then earth. No, no, no. It's earth and Mars. Earth, earth and Mars. And so Mars. Mars is further. And then, so if that's the case, it's like, how far is the distance between uh, earth and Mars? Yeah. I'm I think, right uh, it's a, it's a few minutes. I think last I checked was maybe like a round trip is ten minutes. Ten minutes. Let me. Oh no. Okay. At its average distance of one hundred twenty forty two million miles, light takes about twelve minutes and forty two oh. seconds to reach Earth from Mars. Damn. So like yeah. a twenty minute round trip. Yep. And that's so, so that's if it's what if you light. Sent it halfway, like you broke up the. You broke up the uh, the pathway from Earth to Mars via satellite. It would still it would still take the same amount of time, right? Because you you would have to do a full round trip. Um, but I'm sure there could be a way to speed up between the 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 object that's in between whatever that is whether it's a satellite or something i'm just i'm just thinking out loud yeah no it, it's a good i think in theory it it would be good if um hmm i wonder if it actually help because this is what i'm thinking so I, that is a fair point so it's like earth mars satellite in between right yeah and you would send information to earth or yeah. you're sending from earth to mars and now mars gets some information uh, now it sends it to mars mars is going to make mean some earth, sort of earth to satellite satellite to mars yeah satellite to mars yeah. and now mars is going to send information back right yeah and i think the only way uh, it actually makes sense is if Earth is sending more information, right? Yeah, as it's as, and, as the information being received. Uh, yeah, on, uh, come in at the same time. Yeah, yeah. But if you think about it, that's that round trip still is twelve. Uh, it's twenty minutes, right? Regardless of like the information that you're retrieving back from the first packet, if like that information. Uh, you sent some sort of like acknowledgement, let's say that still took 12 minutes each way. Yes. So, Regardless so, if you have a satellite in between. So what you're saying is it's not good for two-way communication. Yeah. <laughs> instant communication. <laughs> yeah. There's no, it's not good for instant communication, but 12 minutes is a 20 minute round trip for like a mass upload. That's not, that's not that bad. Like so, it would take still forever. But. What would be a use case for that? Like uh, transferring some sort of data, or yeah, oh, just that. So right? there's so, so many use cases, right? Like yeah. there's I'm just audio. Trying to make it, yeah, I'm trying to make it plain. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, audio, video. Um, you want to be able to communicate with your loved ones back on Earth. Um, 
just like specs, data, data specs about like your aircraft or something, you know, um, there's probably so many things you want to be able to send to, to Mars if they're there. Right. And you have information, um, uh, from earth. Yeah, that is quite interesting. So the only thing you wouldn't get is like I said, like I mentioned earlier, instant communication, but you could, you could still, um, transfer data for, um, any purpose otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I know that, um, I know we're kind of shifting gears here, but Duran, you, you were talking about Disney and the CEO being uh, fired. I was just a bit interested in that. Um, t- tell pivot. me what you've been hearing. I know it's a hard pivot. You know how we do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what are your thoughts? Why why did the CEO get fired? I didn't hear much about this. Yeah, I heard about it in the news today, or was it yesterday? One of the two, uh, where the the CEO at uh, Disney, well, no longer the CEO, Bob Chapek, um, was fired or let go, and the older CEO that was uh, that preceded Bob Chapek was another Bob, Bob Iger. <laughs> <laughs> he's back on the throne um for disney and uh, the 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 stock market liked it um disney's fri- uh, stock price went up like 10 percent uh, oh shit upon the news yeah it's because it's because bob Iger has a has a great track record in the past and obviously he's done this job before he got disney yeah. to where they were until bob chapek took over and honestly bob chapek didn't have um didn't walk into the greatest situation because he literally took took over the company when covid hit yeah yeah in fact a lot of people at that time including myself i was wondering about the timing of bob Iger stepping down at that time um but he remained as chairman chairman from what i what i believe to help with um bob chapek's transition and I guess dealing with all that, it's not easy, right? You're dealing with COVID, dealing with, you know, multiple areas within the business over that time being shut down, not much income coming in from, for example, yep. the park businesses for a long time. And and now, you, now you're dealing with other issues like, you know, inflation and people spending less. And at the same time, they're, they're Disney's building their own um, streaming service. From from scratch, yeah. like literally from scratch, right? And that's not an easy job. Did they build it during COVID? Yeah, yeah they they actually uh, they actually released it around COVID, if I'm not mistaken, or just before. Okay. Uh, so in that sense, the timing was good for the release of, of Disney Plus mm-hmm. because with the lockdowns, more people that turned to streaming, right? Yeah, and um, it helped them with gaining a lot of subscribers over that period uh they right. really skyrocketed the amount of uh subscribers that they were gaining and mm-hmm. um and you could see that in terms of how the stock price was moving uh, people were anticipating you know uh, a lot of growth from their disney plus business uh, right. but it seems like right now it's slowed down um and not only that it's also the revenue that they get per user um mm-hmm. uh, i don't want to i don't want to get my math wrong or give a wrong numbers but well, what i'll say is i'll keep it generic they're what they make on per per user on average is about half of what netflix would make and they have yeah, okay. more subscribers than than netflix right? so does it offset it <laughs> somehow or no because they have more subscribers and they have half. So do they have double the amount of subscribers as Netflix? So are they, they making the same amount? They, they don't. They don't. They they have a few million more than Netflix. Okay. They just surpassed Netflix in, in terms of ha- having the most subscribers uh, in amongst all streaming services. Wow. Um, but yeah, they, they're just trying to figure out. And that's probably one of the reasons why Shapec got got out outsted outsted because um they're still figuring out how to bring disney plus to profitability 
Right. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what Bob Iger does. He obviously has a good reputation and uh, he made some really strategic acquisitions in the past uh, with respect to, he was the one who got Pixar, uh, bought Pixar oh, wow. from, from Steve Jobs. Yeah. He, wow. he he negotiated that purchase. He was the one that helped with purchasing Marvel. He was the one that helped with purchasing Lucas Films, right? Mm. So all these like amazing IP that everyone knows about, right? Yeah, and it's going to be something that's going to hold on like in in people's be a part of people's lives for generations to come. I don't yeah. know, man. I don't know. I, I mean, Marvel was yes. That's actually like a huge hire given how how it's exploded i still yeah. question if lucas films was worth one billion i'm a huge star wars fan but those films needed to end <laughs> like <laughs> well clearly they, a, they did they did tell me tried milking right yeah who <laughs> which one of you guys watched the, the new films i don't even know what's happening in them yeah no i oh, i watched but all the thing of them. Is, yeah yeah I don't know where the other ones this these new shows are, but Mandalorian. I heard Ma- and I heard, Mar- yeah, yeah. I heard Mandalorian is good, and I heard yeah. Andor is actually pretty good. But yeah, people like really waited for those shows. To be honest, yeah, yeah. I'm That's one of those guys. Although I did not watch Andor yet, I uh, just been super busy. But the other shows, um, Mandalorian was amazing. Obi Wan Kenobi, the show on that, that was amazing. Because uh, yeah. they, spoiler alert. They brought, they brought back uh, Darth Vader. Not that they. Brought oh back. man, I was gonna watch yeah. it. You fucking not, ruined not that it. they brought back, but it's set. It's not really a spoiler because it's set in the timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, in the timeline right after Revenge of the Sith, right, okay. which is the third one. So when Anakin becomes Darth Vader, so it's right after that. So it's in that I'm- timeline. Yeah. I'm nodding my head, but I know nothing about Star Wars. <laughs> like I literally go watch the movies and I'm like, yeah. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, on another curveball, since we're talking about streaming, if you guys haven't watched, um, or if you guys haven't watched any shows on Apple TV, I recommend it. Yeah, I. That's if we have Apple TV. <laughs> I'm going to just, just get it on IPTV. You guys know what that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, Apple TV has like really good shows. Like If you haven't watched Ted Lasso, I think that is a must-watch show. Everyone's Even talking if, about that. Yeah. Ted Lasso, it's what like... Ted Lasso. On the surface, it's about a, a football coach that goes to England and starts coaching professional soccer. I mean, the words <laughs> will be... But it's, yeah. it's genuinely a good show. Um, and then Severance is really good. And then recently, it's, uh, Shantaram. It's, uh, Shantaram is based on a book. It's about uh, an Australian dude that breaks out of prison, runs away to India, and then starts living in the slums of Delhi. Holy shit. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, and what it's a like twist. Harsh, I know, right? Like, it was all, it was all in the... It, in the 80s or 70s too so like you know this man was sticking out like a sore thumb but he literally yeah. lives in like the ghetto like the ghetto ghetto wow well if you break out of prison that's the only way, the only place you could yeah. probably hide you know exactly uh, right. Delhi out of all places probably has a <laughs> larger population than the fucking country he left <laughs> just, yeah. just that city <laughs> just the village within the city yeah well, like, it, I mean, I, it, it, they don't show it in the show, but it's in the book. He does go to, the, like, the village at some point and, like, spends, nice. like, a, 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 some time in, like, v- rural India. It's, it's wild. That's jokes. Yeah, yeah Apple's, Apple's, uh, Apple's just a very interesting company. They, they just know how to uh, create revenue and add value to people's lives. Most of Honestly. the time. Crazy. Yeah, but I, I, you know what I think it is? It's like they do obviously have a really good product, right? And they, they put time into um, yeah. their product overall. Um, but then then they also have um, the marketing to back it up, yeah. right? It's always been those two kind of core tenants in business. If you have a really, really good product and yeah. you don't have marketing, your product's not going anywhere. Right, uh, because you you have a product, but nobody knows about it. But if you have really good marketing and a shit product, you'll sell it 
initially and then nobody will ever buy it again because it's a shit yeah. product yeah. right so you need those two core tenants and they have both they have insane yeah. marketing and they have a really good decent decent product i would say because i'm a i'm an apple hater but Does, they have a decent product to back it up does apple well, actually have it, good marketing i can't remember the last apple ad i've seen that's exactly but tv no that's no no, no the marketing is an ad it isn't just ads right marketing is uh everything a to like a to z right they they think about things like for example i was just watching this uh thing the other day where they were talking about how customer success looks like so you know when you open up the apple um their like version of siri i don't know what it's called but um the box itself they they slow it down when you're lifting it up they put like m- friction in there on yeah. purpose so it takes a yeah, bit yeah. longer to open the box so that it creates anticipation right yeah, they, they actually spend way too much time planning the packaging but it, it is nice packaging <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's crazy pa- that's part of the experience and they it's like every point in the life cycle of like customer like uh acquisition to all the way to returns like the the talk talk I was listening to, he was talking about this. He's like, it, they were talking about the packaging and it takes like, I think like 10, 15 seconds longer just to get thing open. And in that time, you're getting anticipation of opening it. And he's like, I didn't use the product. He's like, I didn't, I didn't even end up using it. So after three months, he went back and all he had to do was like, he handed them the product and they're like, all right, thank you. And he's like, that's it. Like, there's no receipts. There's no, he's like, no, nothing. Everything will be like credited towards your, uh, kind of ID, etc. You can just you're good to go. And so he's like that experience was amazing. And so that's marketing. Every aspect of of that uh, interaction was still marketing mm-hmm. for Apple. Right. Next time he's gonna go, even if it's not that product, he'll buy another product because he had a, such a good experience with that company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Their their marketing is top notch and. And also their ability to keep you in the ecosystem uh, because of the the switching, yeah, the switching mode that they created. Like it's a pain in the ass for someone using Apple to switch to anything else. And like literally that ecosystem they created is you're tied to it once you're in it, right? Like just the old saying, once you go. What is it? Once you go Mac, you don't go, don't go back. <laughs> well, we know where that one started, but um, <laughs> but I think it's it's it is very interesting. They they have really good marketing, even like in shows, right? They've paid for those top ads where you just see the Apple logo, right? Uh, multiple like obviously vendors do that, but they I feel like they do it fairly well. Um, they have a clean design. You see Apple. Um, they've made it a. a, a premier superior product right like it's a premium product not everybody can have it and so it's a luxury item right um so their marketing is insane like for example ferrari do you think they have to spend a lot on marketing not probably they they probably still do but they spend it in a way that is like you you want to have ferrari but you can't that's essentially the model that and they only create about I don't know how many they create, but apparently they have the largest margins in all of the auto industry just because it doesn't really? take that much. Yeah. Huh. It's insane. I heard that too. Yeah. 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 Because it, wow. it, it, um, they're, they're status symbols, right? And that's what Apple has become. It's become a status symbol. There you go. I'm going to, I'm going to, I disagree with that. After using Apple for, I mean, after switching to Apple for a lo- for some time now, I actually kind of disagree with at least their laptops to a degree are not, I don't think a status symbol. I think I, I, I'm going to be real. Like, no, no, no. This guy is like literally. I'm going to Apple.com right now. One second. You, you keep going. Continue. Continue. <laughs> like, what do you have? Mac- <laughs> MacBook Air? That's what you have? Yeah. I have All a right. MacBook Air. All right. Okay, so do you have the M1 chip or the M2 chip? M1. Okay, let, let me go with the M1 chip, right? Starts on 13, 13, uh, twelve ninety nine. Okay, that's fair, right? That's a that's a decent size, um, or de- decent price, sorry. Okay, let's see. So eight I know gigs. 
I know what you're doing. You're trying to compare it to a compare comparable like Windows laptop, and it's not the same. It really is isn't. Not it isn't. But the thing is, right? If you uh, if you get the lower end version, you're essentially getting nothing. Like I'm getting 256 gigabytes of SSD storage, right? With the base. So not, if I go, that's what I have. If, it's more than enough. Is it all right? And then um, if you use cloud, yeah. If you use a cloud system as well, huh? that's fair. Okay, add to bag. This guy's actually purchasing a Mac. This guy's so cheesed. <laughs> guy's on the call, by the time I end it, I'm like, wait a minute, this is actually not that bad. <laughs> I end up buying the laptop. <laughs> that be jokes. Like, just to get the USB-C cable to charge my laptop, it's an extra 25 bucks. Oh, yeah, they, the they did that. Like, I, that's why I said they most of the time they get it. When I bought it, like, the only upgrade I did was adding 16 gigs because as a developer, you kind of need that extra RAM. So but why would you think, buy it, more? Why? Yeah. Battery life, the size of it, and the experience of using it. Battery life, running it, like, there's no fan on my thing, but it runs literally, like, I was running Docker, I was running um, IntelliJ, and I was running all these microservices. I was programming on my in my bed for, like, three, three four hours, right? And that's when it drained. That's... On an equivalent like laptop, like I around that time I had a my own refurbished Dell laptop, which I upgraded with like thirty two gigs of RAM. Right, that's a monster machine, but it will die. It is heavy. Like even then, it's not heavy heavy, but like compared to my app, like my MacBook Air, it's nothing. Like I can slip my MacBook Air into a small bag and take it and I can still do work is it, the same with my MacBook Pro right like mm -hmm. it that is expensive like don't get me wrong like that is an expensive machine but yeah. in terms of if you can afford it as a developer like I've said this before it is worth it like I can see sure. why I forget which company they like they're like okay you, you guys can have all your old MacBook laptops we're just gonna buy you this MacBook Pro because it will save them money in the long term between developer productivity and just compile time hmm. yeah yeah so so i guess your reasoning is an, an uh, is like almost an anomaly because uh that's a that's fair that's fair right like, like that makes sense why you have it and there's a particular reason but there's a lot of people that just get it because it looks good yeah or you know <laughs> i thought yeah, yeah. was gonna be like Battery life, uh, developer experience. Oh, and status symbol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's people that, that get it just because it it represents status, like especially amongst younger generations. Like, oh no, hundred percent. Yeah, they they get it. Oh, it's Apple. Like it's like you know you you're you're the cool kid. You have an Apple. The the yeah. way I think of status symbol is that like it's expensive, but it doesn't add that value like louis vuitton was selling like thousand dollar e earbuds right like yeah but you can ridiculous. get like i don't know sony earbuds for like 30 300 bucks and they outclass them by miles right that to me yeah. is a status symbol you're just buying it to the for the flex like That's it's fair. true that apple like a lot of kids do that right yeah. we'll buy like the airpods for the, for flex. the flex but yeah. like they actually are a decent product yeah okay yeah that's fair airpods may be a bit overpriced compared to like the competition like yeah apple's not perfect don't get me wrong but yeah. i don't know they, they, they make good shit oh that's I, fair and that's how they rope you in sorry to run the code. <laughs> no no, no. <laughs> they'll be like one good product we'll get we'll get them on the other ones <laughs> yeah the, the the air max the air max does not seem worth it at all like i would get i would rather get a bose quiet comfort any day of the week over the Air Max. Yeah. 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 Like what? Like I, 500 bucks for the overhead? Oh. I, I heard just the pros the one... are really good though. Oh man. The Quiet Comfort, any series. You can even get like the Series 2, which is like three, four years old now, I think. Man, it is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Their, their, uh, what, their what uh, noise canceling software technology, I think that's untouchable. Which company? Uh, Bose. Bose, Bose, okay, got it. Yeah, so I I just put in the M1 chip with the 13, 16 gigs. What you just did, plus you need Apple Care, right? 
which is two ninety nine, or yeah, two twenty nine. And yeah. then you add a cable, twenty five bucks, and an adapter for twenty five bucks, and it comes up to two thousand and sixty five uh, dollars. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. right. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's yeah. And oh, guys, guys, but they give you free shipping, which is <laughs> fucking awesome. Thank you, Apple. I really appreciate it. <laughs> they, I remember, I, I one time I went on their site just to create like a Mac. What is a MacBook Pro? Like not a pro uh, studio. Let me, like it's a it was the tower. I forgot what it was called. Uh, yeah, there's a. I don't even know if they sell it anymore. It's not the. It wasn't the laptop, but it was essentially the server, and I like upgraded it to the max, right? And it was like fifty k. And you know what they said at the end? Oh, like don't worry about shipping. Like we got you for shipping. It's like, of course, fucking fifty k la- like machine. You better pay for shipping. I was so annoyed. <laughs> Anyways, um, no, that's fair. Like honestly, I I might get a Mac later on in life, but I think I'm I'm good for Just now. Gotta, gotta, yeah, I gotta gotta hold on to the spite for a bit more. Yeah, like I've been holding on for a good, I think, eight years. I did this all throughout university. You know me. Um, there is one on laptop that might be switch back, but I, I, I need to wait, f- wait a bit more just to get some idea of how it's going to perform. It's like the framework laptop. Maybe we can discuss oh, it. I like, heard about those. Yeah, let's, I'm down to discuss that next episode. It's really interesting uh, concept. So let's write that down. What's it called? Yeah framework i've been i've been looking at that it's actually so smart in terms of what they've done well i guess we'll save it for next time yeah yeah Mm -hmm. from hearing it hearing the name it sounds like one of those modular type devices wow good Good job yeah nice that's good marketing that's actually impressive that is good marketing i would have i don't know i wouldn't have connected that that's that's pretty good yeah from um from crypto chains to IPFS to streaming to Apple, yeah, to laptops, exactly to yeah. to uh, streaming data between multiple planets. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's let's end with a let's end with a fun uh, streaming question. Like, if there was, I think we've talked about this before offline some months ago, but if there was one streaming uh, platform. That you would let go. Oh no, not let go. Keep. Let's go with keep. One that you would keep. Yeah. Which one would it be? Yeah, if you had to let go of all mm. other streaming services, like you're at gunpoint, yeah. and they're like, yeah. "Give me all the streaming services." Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to keep. Yeah, you have to keep one. <laughs> so, um, what, which, which streaming service would you keep? Uh, answer it in the comments below. Um, well, let us know. We'll you discuss guys ours next episode. Yes, we will discuss our next episode. All right. All right, everyone. Really appreciate the time. Uh, Thank you for listening and uh, subscribe if you can. Thank you.